thank you all very much for, for joining and uh, um, over to you, Daniela. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. It's a pleasure to have so many on board. And um, we're going to be talking today about getting teenagers to speak and write, which I'm sure you all perhaps um, at some stage in your teaching careers have seen as a challenge, found as a challenge. I certainly have. And uh, in, in this session, I'd like to have a look, first of all, at some of the changes in the new CFR companion volume, which has just come into place. And I'd like to particularly look at the productive skills. And then we'll be looking at some practical ideas on how we can encourage and motivate teenagers to speak and write in the classroom. So I'd like to first of all have a look at the productive skills in the CFR companion volume. And I'd like to have a brief look at the communicative language activities and strategies. So if we look at the traditional model of the four skills, uh, of course, we have the receptive skills, the reading and listening skills. And then the traditional model also introduces the productive skills, which is speaking and writing. In the new CFR, the productive skills have an additional element. And the four skills, the traditional model, is replaced. And we have what we have a lot of additions that are very valid. First of all, the traditional model is replaced by activities that are presented on the four modes of communication. And the four modes are reception, production, interaction, and mediation. And I personally believe that these descriptors for other communicative activities that have been added are also of great value. For example, we all know that in the recent years we have become more active online. So we have an active online interaction aspect descriptor and other aspects or descriptors also include using telecommunications, expressing reactions to creative text and literature. And the, the productive skills in the CFR companion volume this year really capture the complex reality of communication. I believe they are closer to real life language use. So uh, if we have a look at the communicative language activities and strategies at the four categories that I've just mentioned, uh, obviously we're looking at the production and the new uh, area, which is interaction. And of course, reception is all about understanding language produced by others. And then the production is simply producing speech or writing. And the interaction is more about written or spoken exchanges. So the receptive and productive skills traditional scheme is replaced by the spoken production and interaction and also written production and interaction. And if we look specifically at what we mean by production, uh, production includes both speaking and writing activities. And spoken production is one student or one person talking. It's not about communication. It's about producing long term, which may involve a sh perhaps a short description, maybe a description of a person or a description of a house. And it might be an anecdote, a short story, or it may also imply a longer, more formal presentation, such as, a, let's say, a presentation in class. If we call out a student to come in front of the class and they have done some research and they are presenting on a topic that we have given them previously. Obviously, long-term presentation is most used in academic contexts. So if students are preparing for university studies, this is a very important aspect of uh, spoken or even written production. If we look at the CFR, at the, at the new descriptors, if we look at the production activities that we see over here, I'd just like to highlight a couple of uh, areas that we perhaps do in class. 
which is um, describing experience and creative writing, such as writing stories, etc. Uh, looking at the other area, interaction compared to production, interaction is considered to be a spoken interaction is considered to be the origin of language. And this is actually, I'm quoting here from the CFR companion volume with the new descriptors, 2018. And here we have very, very important areas such as interpersonal interaction, collaborative and transactional functions. Uh, looking at this uh, interactive aspect of communication, uh, one of the things that I'm sure you will agree with me is that interaction is also fundamental in learning. So if learners are communicating in class, perhaps recycling vocabulary, sharing ideas, etc., we know that this is something that we do on a daily basis in day-to-day -day teaching. And the new CFR really reflects the scales for interaction strategies uh, because it continues aspects such as turn-taking, cooperating or collaborative strategies and asking for clarification. So looking at what this means in, in the graph that we have over here or the, the, or the chart over here, the interaction activities uh, are, again, something that we do in day-to-day -day teaching. And I'd like to just highlight uh, two or three here. First of all, conversation, something that we do um, perhaps throughout a session. Informal discussion. Again, we would ask students, you know, how was your weekend? Or we would go on to more deeper subjects such as what is your opinion on something? In the written interaction, I'd like to highlight again something that we commonly use in the classroom and we develop in the writing activities, and that is, uh, for example, notes, messages, etc. And uh, the new aspect of the Common European Framework, of course, is online communication. So this would very much go in line with the notes, messages and forms in the interaction activities where this is a kind of new aspect added to it. What does that mean for us as teachers? Well, I think the name of the session itself uh, summarizes what the practical applications of the CFR or the new addition to the CFR are. In a way, it is getting teenagers to speak and write. Basically, it's about producing language, whether it is a production or whether it is in an interactive um, environment, such as a dialogue between pairs or groups, etc. So I'm sure that you have at times seen your students looking a little bit like this, uh, where perhaps we think as teachers that we have a wonderful uh, idea for a story. Our minds are full of ideas, but our students are either bored, demotivated, or simply have no ideas. And maybe we as teachers might be asking ourselves what, perhaps feeling even desperate. And the question, of course, is how can I help them? How can I help my learners to speak and write? How can I help my learners to be accurate and to be fluent in the productive skills? I'd like to now have a look at some practical ideas that you can apply in the classroom. And uh, the first area I'd like to look at is personalization. So if we have a look at a page from a course that you might be avail that you might be familiar with, which is Gateway Second Edition, you can see that we have a unit here, unit two, and uh, the name of the unit is nine to five. And here we're looking at uh, introducing some new vocabulary. The vocabulary that we're introducing is to do with jobs and work conditions and responsibilities. As you can see in the bottom part of the page, we have a list of jobs in a box. And what we would do with this activity or with this part of the unit 
As part of introducing new language, we're looking at topical vocabulary, we are introducing the words, and we are also developing language from simple words to, let's say, expressions, idiomatic expressions, uh, phrasal verbs, and any kind of practical language to do with this topic. What the unit then presents is an activity where we are developing learners speaking. And if you have a look at this particular activity, the label for this task is negotiating and collaborating. And this obviously goes with the descriptors of the Common European Framework. We talked about collaboration being a really important aspect of group work. And I think you will agree with me that it is something that we need to develop for learners or help learners develop for life because we do collaborate in many day-to-day -day tasks. So if we have a look at this, the question is, how dangerous do you think these jobs are? So I'd like you to just have a look at these five jobs and think if you could pick one of these jobs as being the most dangerous, which one would you pick? Okay, I can see some responses. Firefighter, firefighter, and I think that's the only job that you're coming up with. Interesting, we have pilot here as well. Formula One driver, okay, police officer. I think some countries more dangerous than others. Interesting, uh, whenever I ask my students to pick the most dangerous job out of these five, firefighter seems to be the one that they usually choose out of, out of these jobs. Interestingly, uh, I have a friend in England uh, called Mark, and he's a firefighter. So one day I asked Mark whether he thought his job was dangerous. And his response was, Danny, are you joking? All we do is rescue cats. So uh, this is a little uh, joke, uh, but you know we have a lot of pets in England, and firefighters really do rescue a lot of animals. So what we're looking at here with, with our students is uh, we're looking at a very general speaking task where they are discussing together in groups. If we have a look at that, they are negotiating and collaborating. And the part where we are developing their speaking is as part of discussion or through discussion. So what the students do is they discuss the question in pairs or groups, and then they perhaps decide which the most dangerous job is. If we look at this task further, the next part of the activity is another question. And here the students are speaking. They're working with a partner. And they're looking at the jobs in the diagram. And the question is, would you like to do any of these jobs? Why or why not? And if we think of this, we're going on from very general discussion and collaboration to personalization, where the students are reflecting on what they would prefer to do or not to do. And I have an idea for you that you can use if you want to work with personalization. I believe that this is a very important aspect of teaching where students become more motivated when it is meaningful for them in terms of personalization, in terms of personal experience, in terms of personal opinions, etc. So if we have a look at this question again, as you can see, we have a frame here with some boxes. And we are looking at the same question, which is, would you like to do any of these jobs? And what I ask my learners to do is to uh, look at pictures of jobs that perhaps are reflecting, reflected in the book. So we're doing a little bit of recycling of topical vocabulary. And what I ask my students to do, if, let's say I show them a picture of a firefighter, which is the job that we had on the previous slide. And then I ask students to write the job into the frame according to their personal preference. So, for example, the best job would be in the inner frame. 
So if they want to be a fire, firefighter or they believe that this is a good job for them, then they would put that near the center or the inner frame. And then let's take another job. Uh, we have construction worker. Perhaps this is a job that my st the student that is writing these jobs into the frame would really not like to do. Then they will write construction worker in the outer frame. The really important aspect of this is that they do not say the words. They look at the pictures and they recycle the vocabulary for themselves. So they look at the picture, they think of the word, and then they write the word into the frame. And then what happens is that each student will have a very different, or perhaps some of them will have a similar, but they will have these uh, vocabulary items, the jobs, in different parts of the frame. And then the pairs or groups discuss their personal preferences and also give reasons why perhaps they would like to or would not like to be a firefighter, a construction worker, etc. What you can also do is add some interesting jobs to the ones that you take out of the course book or jobs that are perhaps strange. Uh, for example, you could add window cleaner and discuss whether this is dangerous or not. And ones that you might consider are this job. And whenever you ask students, what is this job? They might come up with various vocabulary. Of course, this is a snake milker who is getting the venom out of the snake as an antidote. If, if we are bitten by a snake, then we get an antidote. Another interesting job might be pet food taster or dog food taster. This always makes students laugh. Yes, there are people who are tasting dog food to see if it's edible and delicious for dogs or other pets. And uh, another job that I find quite interesting is this job. Have a little guess what this might be. No idea. <laughs> OK. Diver. Yes, it is a diver. And if you look at what he's holding in his hand, they're not eggs, but they're golf balls. Very good. Somebody saying, Olga saying golf balls diver can be. Um, or the official term is golf ball collector. But diver is also acceptable. And again, this is a motivational aspect, bringing in some interesting jobs uh, alongside the jobs that we are recycling from the course book. Okay, I'd like you to perhaps consider how we could use this grid uh, for other topics, other questions. What could students be thinking about in terms of vocabulary topics? Putting something in the center or in the inner box and something on the outer areas? Can you perhaps think of other topics that we could use this activity for? Food, wonderful. Free time, wonderful. Music, sport, favorite music, yes. Places to live, good one. Animals, hobbies, toys, plants, clothes, sports, films, travel. Very good, wonderful. Thank you for your ideas. I have uh, these ideas. Uh, one of the interesting areas that you can use this for is personal traits. For example, you could put a question um, such as, which personal traits do you value most in a friend or a partner? Worst crime, again, if you're recycling this vocabulary, topical unit vocabulary, crime, animals, food, drink. Or you could make it really personal and culturally relevant, for example, most interesting sites in your city, etc. Okay, if we have a look at a, another area that we can work on with students in terms of speaking and writing is focusing on accuracy. And one of the 
one of the questions I'd like to ask you is if we have a look at this slide, if we say accuracy, and you can think of perhaps an activity where we are, where the aim of the activity is accuracy, what are the learners focusing on during an accuracy based activity? And what are you as a teacher focusing on? So you have a picture here to help you perhaps. Okay, good. Mistakes is one of the answers I can see. The right word, errors, wonderful, correct. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your input. Yes, what the learner is focusing on is the correct use of language. So if we have an accuracy based activity that is re recycling vocabulary, then we are looking at the cor correct use of the vocabulary in the right context. If, let's say, we have an activity focusing on accuracy in terms of grammar, then we are looking at the correct use of grammar that we have done with our students in a previous lesson. And this is where we have a really important question, which is, what is the teacher focusing on? And some of you have already mentioned that, the teacher is focusing on correction, error correction. And if we really want to follow the aims of an accuracy-based activity, we need to focus on correcting on the spot. So if a student is making a mistake, we need to stop the student and we need to correct that mistake. Because if we are not correcting on the spot, then this activity stops being an accuracy-based activity and the delayed correction, perhaps, is bringing different aims into the activity. So if we have a look at another example from uh, one of the Macmillan courses, this time we're looking at Optimize, you can see we have a unit on technology over here. And we have something very popular with various generations, children, young adults, teenagers, which is the game Minecraft. And if, if we look at this article, we have an article that reflects some of the language that we have used with our students, let's say, in a presentation, which is reviewing tenses, particularly present perfect, simple, and continuous. And if we have a look at this activity, uh, we have introduced this new language, and we are perhaps looking at present perfect for life experience. Once we have introduced this grammar, we might be looking at um, correcting on the spot. So let's imagine the students are recycling this language and we have an activity focusing on accuracy. What we are doing is uh, we perhaps might ask our students as a little communication activity in plenary, have you ever played Minecraft? And what we, what we might do is ask one of our learners in the classroom and the learner, a boy, perhaps a teenage uh, student, might say, I never played Minecraft. As a teacher, I know he has made a mistake. So what I do is I correct him and I say, you have, n you have never played Minecraft. And his response is, yes. I never played Minecraft. So I repeat again, I correct him again, and I say, you mean you have never played Minecraft? And he says, no, I've never played Minecraft. As you can see what the student is doing, he is doing too many things at the same time. He is listening to the teacher. He's taking on board that he has made a mistake but he's, it's impossible for him to correct himself, analyze the language, and then actually produce the correct utterance or the sentence. So what we can rethink is, uh, if, I, if I look back at this slide, uh, you can see that we call this the recast error correction. And this technique is really great with young children, preschoolers, perhaps children in the first grade, etc. But with teenagers, 
this is not as effective as the methods of error correction that I have outlined in my next slide. So uh, perhaps you can use um, elicitation and you can directly ask the student to correct that by using this sentence, can you correct that? You can also use metalinguistic feedback. For example, you can ask the student to complete the structure by saying the present perfect is have had plus what and you ask them to complete or you use repetition such as I have never I have never and you wait for the resp response another really effective technique is finger correction if you don't use it try it out it's wonderful particularly ladies if you have rings uh, they're wonderful I don't know if you can see my hand but you can use your fingers to show students words. For example, I have never seen this film. I have never tried, etc. And the ring could be the word have. So I have, but have you ever, etc. So try it out. There are techniques that are very uh, visually supportive in terms of error correction. If we have a look at the accuracy aspect of writing, uh, one of the aspects that we perhaps are not doing so much anymore, but we used to see that, is correction of every single error, mistake and slip in red. Now, if the students receive this kind of writing, they might be a little disheartened and they might want a little more support from us as teachers and not feel as desperate that their writing is not good enough. So uh, what I suggest is if we have a piece of writing, we might um, perhaps not correct every single mistake but really focus on the main mistakes that are relevant to the unit that we are working on, current, currently working on. So if we have a look at this piece of writing, you might underline using two colours. I use, for example, instead of red, orange or pink and green. And I think you might uh, already know what I mean by green. Green is a very positive colour. Um, and I also use these smiley faces where I show the learners what they should be careful about, which is the orange color. And I also tell them what they have done well. So I pinpoint the areas in the language or in the writing style that I think are well produced. So let's not forget also about uh, showing learners what they are doing well rather than just focusing on the negatives also focus on the positives so in this letter for example i'm showing the learner that they need to be careful about using present perfect for life experience but i might also say your collocation is very well used in this particular writing and another uh, correction method that i think works really well is focusing on one aspect so not on all grammar tenses, but on just one. Or maybe one week you focus on grammar and the following week you focus on correction of vocabulary use in the writing and you ignore grammar even if they make mistakes. Uh, what I sometimes do with students is I put up a chart in the classroom and I actually uh, write in the chart on the wall what the error correction focus of this week is so that they are aware of what we are working on. Uh, let's have a look at an idea here. The idea is that writing is not natural. I mean, you can think of what the next part of the sentence is. If it's not natural, what do we need to do as teachers? It means that our learners have to learn how to write. And this to us as teachers, because obviously speaking and listening, is, they are natural skills, which we learn from early childhood. But writing is not a natural skill. This is something we must learn. And the second quote I have is from Penier, and this is, we need to devote a lot of attention to, 
And again, you can think of what we might as teachers need to devote our attention to. I think it's pretty obvious it's about teaching writing. So even though we might be using writing less in real life than the other skills, in this case perhaps speaking, we actually need to, to devote much more time to teaching writing than, let's say, teaching speaking, if we want our learners to produce good results in terms of accuracy and also fluency. So if we look at developing writing, uh, we have a story here, as you can see. And in this story, we have pictures. It's a picture story. Stories is something that we develop with learners. And if we look at this particular activity, this is again from Gateway. And I think this is a really nice activity. It's very motivating for learners to do this, particularly if you give them a time limit of, let's say, one minute. So the task for the learners here is, look at this sentence. And the sentence is, a woman was writing. And the task here for the learners is to look at the picture and expand the sentence by adding words to describe the scene in more detail. So you ask students to have a look at the sentence. You give them one minute and they produce a sentence. Then you can make it competitive. We all know that teenagers love competition. And uh, you might say, who can write more words or the most words? And then they count the words and perhaps they come up with this sentence. It was in the middle of a cold winter and a bright young woman was sitting quietly at home writing her very first novel. Well, what is really important here is that we don't just look at producing more words, we also specifically look at how we have expanded this sentence. So the question for students is, what types of words have been added to the sentence? And we are also looking at, why is the sentence more interesting? I think we have all had students uh, produce very poor writing, uh, even if their spoken production is wonderful. Or maybe their passive knowledge of vocabulary and grammar is really extensive. But still, they write stories such as, it was very cold and very dark, and I was very tired. The morning was very boring. And, and you, you count the words very and really, and let's say in one piece of writing, you have 26 reallys and 10 varies. And of course, the potential is not fulfilled. So what we do with students, and this is what Gateway suggests, we have a writing bank here. And as you can see, we have suggestions of, on how we can make stories more interesting, such as adding adjectives and adverbs, or using a variety of past tenses, or using words and expressions of time and sequence. So we don't just ask students to do the task, we ask learners to reflect on why and how the writing is more accurate, more interesting, and more advanced in this case. We're moving on from accuracy to fluency now. And one of the things, uh, whilst working with teachers, one of the things that repeatedly comes up in question time is, how can I promote fluency and particularly, how can I assess fluency? How can I, what, what should I look at when I'm teaching fluency? And what should I look at when I'm assessing fluency? Because it's very easy to correct a learner if they make a gram grammatical mistake, either in speaking or writing. But it's very difficult to teach them how to be fluent and to tell them how they can improve in terms of fluency. So I'd like to uh, look at, uh, at the same task as we looked at in accuracy, which is, again, asking you a question. If we are doing an activity, whether it's a spoken or written activity, and our focus 
And the learner's focus of this task is fluency. So the aim is fluency. What are the learners focusing on? And what am I as a teacher focusing on? Again, can you reflect on this question, please? OK, we have some responses here. Spontaneous speech, pronunciation, time, OK, intonation, vocabulary. OK, thank you. Thank you for your responses. Let's have a look at that. So if we're looking at fluency, we talked about accuracy being based around language. So anything to do with vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, spelling, if we are focusing on that, we are focusing on accuracy. So what are actually learners focusing on if we are looking at a fluency-based task? Well, ac the actual focus of a fluency task is communication. And the aim for the students is to say something where the message is understood or write something where the message is understood. So we're not looking at the language, but we're looking at how the communication is transferred to the listener or the reader. So now comes the big question. What is the teacher focusing on? And the answer is the teacher doesn't correct on the spot if it's a speaking activity. And the teacher perhaps doesn't correct language if it's a written activity. And if you're doing delayed correction, where you are letting students talk in pairs, you're going around the classroom, you're noting down the errors that they make, and you later look at them either in the same session or in another session tomorrow, the day after, or next week, you are looking at fluency. Uh, one of the things that I do with my students is I make them aware of whether they are focusing on accuracy or fluency. And I do this by giving them the green light if they are, if I want them to aim for the message and the communicative aspects. And the green light is don't think about the language, think about how you come across. So your posture, uh, the way that you communicate through your eyes, your gestures, the volume, so if it's too, too low, then we can't hear you, and also things like projecting confidence, etc. And what I do in class is I put up these flashcards. I have a sample here for you. If we are focusing on fluency, then I put up, as you can see in the picture, the green light. And that means you are free to communicate. Don't worry about language or vocabulary. This means vocabulary, grammar, etc. If we are focusing on accuracy, I put up this sign and I say to my students, I'm going to stop you and I'm going to correct you. So today, in this particular activity, I'd like you to think about your language. So uh, perhaps we could have a look at practical activities that we can do in the classroom to promote spoken or written fluency. Uh, one of the activities that you can do in terms of writing is free writing. Uh, free writing is the kind of writing that we do where we are not inhibited in any way. So it's uninhibited, it's free, as the name suggests, from the thoughts of language. We are just putting some ideas across. We are reflecting on what goes in our minds. We are putting ideas on a piece of paper. And I find that free writing is not something natural to students, but it's very, very important in the class because this focuses on fluency writing. So uh, one of the activities that you can do is you can ask students to watch a mime. If you are a good uh, mimer, you can mime yourselves. Or you can, if you don't want to mime, uh, ask students to watch a short story or short video from a film and make sure it is silent. They watch short parts of a video clip. 
and then they write the first part of the story. So they watch a part of a mime, the first part, and then, and this is really important, you give them a really strict time limit. I usually give two minutes because in two minutes they can get some of the ideas across and if they know they only have two minutes to write the first part of the story, they will not give themselves any time to think about language. They will just try to get across what they've seen. Then they watch the next part of the mime or the video clip and then they write the next part of the story, etc, etc. Uh, for example, you can use a story in four or five parts. You can adapt this activity to speaking as well, where the students are doing exactly the same. They watch the first part of the mime, then they talk together in pairs, then they watch the next part of the mime and again talk in pairs, etc. Uh, what also works is film trailers or short video clips where one student, student A, is watching the clip and student B is facing the student and he or she can't see the clip and they have to listen to, let's say, the film trailer and guess what the film is about, what type of film it is, etc. So uh, a little story that you can use straight away. This is a nice story uh, which you can mime or you can show pictures. Um, you can mime getting up in the morning, getting into a boat, getting uh, some oars into the boat. You might have a basket as well. And what is really important, you get a fishing rod and you load your boat. And then you are rowing on the boat and you are rowing and it's very hot. So you demonstrate how hot you are and the sun is shining and you are fishing and you're really bored. So you reach into the water, you uh, put your hands in the water and you try to sprinkle your face with a little bit of water and what happens is you lose a ring. Okay, it falls into the water. The next part of the story is you catch a really large fish. The fish is huge, you row back to the shore and you open up, open a fire because you want to cook the fish and as you cut the fish open, the ring falls out of the fish. So you're very happy, you have a lovely bit of dinner and of course you have found your ring. So uh, we can perhaps finish off with a few ideas on how to encourage learners to use newly learned language. I'm sure that you will agree with me, this is one of the most difficult aspects of teaching, getting students to use the language that we have produced, or that we have introduced. So um, one of the memories that I have was from a lesson where I was teaching the difference between uh, the future aspect of going to and will. We were looking at the difference between decision now and decision in the past. The lesson went really well and at the end of the lesson the two learners were talking together and of course their sentence was, oh you go to lunch now? And of course as a teacher I was desperate because I could see that no production happened even though the learners uh, participated very well in the session. So uh, I have a picture here which I think represents something very uh, common this happens in our own language as well as in another language that we are learning. Uh, so if your learners uh, have a large gap between their receptive skills and productive skills, this is normal. Uh, but the gap really widens at level B1 and B2. And we often talk about the intermediate or upper intermediate plateau where the students stagnate and, and, and they have good receptive skills but their production is much lower in level than their receptive skills. So uh, if I have a look, at, I will just give you a couple of ideas how you can really push learners to produce the language. And uh, we have another idea here. We have language, introducing language. We're looking at grammar here. And the area that we have introduced is modal verbs. 
speculation, deduction, possibility, and probability. So what we really want our students to do is, if we, if we look at a task in Gateway here, if you look at the bottom part of the page, we have some interesting pictures. Uh, you might uh, think, what are these pictures? Well, the whole task is involved around these pictures where we ask learners to look at these things and speculate about what they think they may, must or can't be. What we really want is when students have a look at a picture is for our student to produce actively in speaking the language that we have introduced. We want the student to say, oh, I think it may be a part of a computer. It can't be edible. And we are happy as teachers because we can see that they are producing the language that we have learned, that we have taught. But what happens in reality? In reality, we all have a so-called lexical teddy bear. And I have a reference at the bottom of the slide to where this term comes from. If you have a look at the picture and you think of that teddy bear, it represents the soft toys that we perhaps are attached to. If you think of a child cuddling a teddy bear, it represents safety, security, something we cuddle, something we stick to, something we won't let go. And I think this is a wonderful term because it represents the vocabulary that we all have that is safe. So what the students, and, and students apply this to grammar as well. So instead of saying, it may be a computer, it could be a part of a computer, they will stick to the language that they, they are safe with, that they have been using for months or years. And they will say things like, it's a part of a computer, or we can't eat it. So what we need to do as teachers, we really need to push learners to use new language. And uh, the idea that I use regularly with my students is um, they score points for using new language. So let's say they are working in pairs. Student A speculates what the picture may be. And student B listens and gives points if the new language, the target language of the unit is used. In this case, if the student says it must be, it can't be, then student B is taking notes and giving points. Uh, note also that if we give tasks to listeners, it really helps involve all students during speaking tasks. So they are all participating in the lesson. So if we look at this task again, we might have a look at these pictures and they are producing new language and scoring points. It may be, it could be a part of a computer. It could be a child. It can't be an animal. I have no idea what this could be, do you? And we have some pictures here that, we have, that I have adapted. Wonderful, someone's saying money, wonderful. Okay, so um, last idea that I'd like to mention is you can also use this scoring system in your correction of their writing. So you can award new language use in productive skills. So if your students have a writing task where they have a story to write, as you can see, we have different uh, words here that we want our students to use. Maybe they're writing a story of, of Larry, the guy who tied himself to a chair and tied lots of balloons to a chair, a Larry Waters story. Um, what I do as a teacher is I award my students. I give one point for each verb that they use in the story in italics and five points for each of the verb in bold used in the story. And the verbs in bold are the verbs that I have introduced in this lesson. So I'm trying to force my students, push my students to use new language and be risk takers. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed this session and hope you've got some new ideas for your lessons. And I hope you found it useful. Um, 
I think we can have a look at some questions and answers. If you have any questions or comments, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Hi, Daniela. Hi, everybody. Hello, Thank Mike. Thank you so much, Daniela. That was a wonderful session. I've got my green pen. I've got my wonderful. <laughs> Good. You can use me as well. <laughs> I just don't have any students, so maybe maybe some of the participants will happily have me in their schools to, to do a lesson. Is that okay with you, participants? So um, we had lots and lots of um, enthusiastic comments during the, the session, Daniela. I think these practical ideas have gone down uh, very well. I remember I saw one comment that said, great, I'm going to use this tomorrow in the classroom. So, um, Wonderful. I'm very yeah. pleased to hear that. That's that's what I would like you to do. Wonderful. Try them out. I've tried so, them out. Um, some people are asking about the, the certificate, and um, that is uh, available now for you um, to download directly um, from uh, this platform. So you just need to click on the link and, and download that. Um, we have um, recorded this session and we will make it um, available on uh, the MacmillanEnglish.com site and also on our YouTube um, site. So I expect that will go up in the next um, couple of days. And does anybody have any questions for Daniela before we go? Daniela, I noticed um, a question uh, during the session when you were talking about uh, the activity using the, the, the video uh, without the sound. Um, and the question yes. was, how much vocabulary support do you suggest giving students before doing this task? I think it really depends uh, what the focus of the activity is. Uh, if if we are focusing on fluency, which was the context that I introduced this in, I would actually perhaps not introduce any vocabulary because I would like the students to produce the language uh, very fluently and naturally, and that would be the focus. So describe the video and what is happening in any language available to you instantaneously. And again, giving a time limit for that really helps. Because I think one of the challenges that we face as teachers is that we focus a lot on accuracy, but we perhaps don't give our students a chance or an opportunity to really focus on the fluency aspect of speaking or even writing. And that is to simply freely, freely um, express themselves. Well, I think it was a great, a great activity, a great tip. Anybody, any more questions for Daniela? So David, uh, if I remember rightly, David is in York. How, how long would you suggest for the mime activity? Okay, um, I, as I mentioned, I would probably go with about four or five sections or segments of the story. So um, if you think of the story of the fish and the ring uh, going on the boat, I would divide it into five short parts. And if we think of the actual writing time, if we're giving two minutes for each of the sections, then the students are actively writing for 10 minutes. So the mime would take, let's say, one minute, and then they'd be writing for a couple of minutes. And I, but giving the strict time limit really forces students and pushes students to think of getting the message across. And this is particularly useful uh, for learners who are too accuracy obsessed even, who really don't want to speak or don't want to write unless their production of language is perfect. So this is a good method to use with, with giving a little more freedom to students. So the whole activity would perhaps take 15 minutes. It says thank you. Um, 
And a question, um, I've lost the question, but how many um, pictures can we just... How many pictures are enough for storytelling or writing? Um, again, it depends on your focus. If you want to recycle vocabulary in a story, then I would pick the vocabulary that is key to the recycling, where the students are actively using the language in the story. Uh, I would probably go for, let's say, uh, Five is a good number. Um, sometimes less is more, as we say. Uh, but I think visuals are really important for learners. Uh, depends on the context. If you want to give context uh, in terms of what the story is about, then I think five or six pictures is enough. If you want to recycle vocabulary, you can go for 10 pictures at the start or during the activity. Great. Well, um... You may have noticed during Daniela's talk that she, she used some examples from Optimize and Gateway. They're our uh, uh, courses. And so if you want any more information uh, about that, you, you can contact your local uh, Macmillan office and they will be able to um, tell you more about those, those books, which are uh, full of lots of, of great activities for, for, for teens. And um, Daniela, I think, um, We'll, we'll let you go now. Thank you so much for the for the wonderful um, session. And we've just had nothing but positive feedback in the in the chat box. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and I hope you find the ideas useful. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you, Daniela, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.